Another group, uh, a little outside our um, orbit, although it does include, of course, um, New Zealand, but these are all our near neighbours. Looking at the Pacific Island states and territories, um, John Howard, who um, works with us at the centre, had a look at recent youth cannabis use, and all of this is school-based data, so these numbers are particularly scary. Um, the asterisks just mean there's no gender data, so that's why they're the same. doesn't signify significance in any way. So you can see here that in Australia, just looking at males, for example, it's about 8% of young people in schools had used cannabis. Um, unfortunately, it's about double that for our friends in New Zealand. And uh, when we move to um, states such as uh, Palau or the Solomon Islands, it's eight times the rate um, that we see in Australia. These are communities, except for New Zealand, of course, that are um, signified by very high unemployment, uh, poverty, rural urban drift, and uh, as they're very much in our neighbourhood and it's increasingly Australia's role to um, be working in this area, cannabis is something we should also be considering. This is um, from one of our many uh, bulletins. All of this data is available on our website. Um, the data is pretty untidy, but the story is clear that um, while we're seeing stable um, or reduced cannabis use in the general population, we're seeing no such change from the very, very high levels of cannabis use amongst those in juvenile detention. We also have the overlay here of high indigenous um, representation in these communities in detention. And from the most recent AIC report, just to remind you that indigenous um, young people are 14 times more likely to be in custody and 24 times more likely to be in detention than their non-indigenous peers. So I could talk forever, and I'm sure you don't want me to, about cannabis harms, but I'll just um, summarise it in one slide. Um, and these data come now from very strong longitudinal studies, two of which are birth cohorts from New Zealand. Um, I don't know why the Kiwis are so fantastic at doing birth cohort studies, but congratulations to the New Zealand taxpayers for supporting them. And what they tell us is a very strong message that early, early adolescent cannabis use is associated with very significant risks. Um, twice as likely to develop dependence for any known exposure to cannabis. Uh, mental health problems, less clear about depression and anxiety, although for females the evidence is stronger. But um, for mental health problems, five times the risk of developing um, psychosis. One that's not spoken about very much, but which is very clearly related to criminal offending, is truancy and dropout. Um, the rates are about three times that for cannabis users than non-cannabis users. And recently, David Ferguson combined three birth cohort studies, his two, the two in New Zealand and one here in Australia, and came out with a very sexy statistic, which is called population attributable risk. And that controls for everything else that could possibly that is measured impinge on um, school failure and found that 17% of that is accounted for by cannabis use alone. So um, if we want to improve educational outcome, let's start working on that. And of course, um, juvenile offending. Cannabis use amongst uh, police detainees. I couldn't be here work talking um, with the AIC without mentioning Juma, which is one of their flagship projects. And there, of course, they see very high levels of urine, uh, urines positive for cannabis amongst police detainees. And uh, their data in 2007, about half reported use, recent use, and at high levels. A little bit um, of New Zealand data just released last year. Um, a large cohort of detainees, and they found that in that group, they also looked at methamphetamine, but I'm just talking about cannabis, um, predicted involvement in acquisitive crime. So those who had purchased cannabis in the previous 30 days were two and a half times more likely to have been involved in acquisitive crime. And uh, cannabis was only found in that study to be associated with property crime, but not with other illicit drug dealing. Looking at adolescents in particular, these data are old, but unfortunately, I mean, it's, it's excellent data and I'd use it anyway. And number two, there's no more recent data of the same quality. So um, while you're familiar with it, probably it's worth mentioning again. Um, 
this was an oversample in a school situation, so these weren't young people that were involved um, in the criminal justice system overtly. Um, they found that cannabis use users were significantly more likely to engage in numerous crime. Uh, these included assaults, malici malicious damage, and acquisitive property crime in particular were five times more likely to have committed those crimes if they used cannabis than not. And uh, P.S.R. Malanen's work in 1995 uh, for Boxer looked at juvenile detainees and once again found a significant relationship not only in committing crime but in the rate of committing crime and it was a dose-response relationship um, and uh, there were the high volume offenders were the cannabis smokers. Now we all like a bit of a causal link, those of us who are academics, you know, is this causal? Uh, I won't bore you with explaining logical inference because I think we all know pretty much one thing either causes the other or something else causes both. Um, and there's very little information about this, but there was a study published quite recently in Addiction, which is our premier journal for drug and alcohol. Uh, it was a Norwegian study that followed 1,300-odd um, individuals from 13 to 27 years of age, and they found a robust association be between cannabis use and later registration of criminal charges, because our lovely friends in Scandinavia can record everything about everybody. It's absolutely fabulous. Data collectors dream. Anyway, what they concluded after a lot of um, statistical jiggery-pokery was that it was largely drug-specific crimes that they were charged with. But um, it, it's quite unusual for someone to go back and analyse someone else's data and say, actually, what you did was wrong, particularly when it's published in such a high-quality journal. Um, but Addiction published this rebuttal um, that said that the methodology and the analytical strategy was not best practice. And they, from this, doing another analysis of the same data, found that cannabis users at age 20 were significantly at greater risk of being charged with criminal offending other than drug-related um, crimes compared with non-users. And interestingly, it's the same odds re ratio, five times. That seems to be the magic number, um, five times more likely um, to have a lot of negative consequences if you use cannabis in adolescence. Looking at uh, community prevention approach, now we've kind of described the problem, let's look and see what we might be able to do. And Tom Carroll um, talked to us yesterday about um, the community-wide um, prevention type messages that have been happening over the last couple of decades. And now the emphasis has changed. They're looking more at the evidence base, um, looking at educational attainment, no longer focusing only on the physical effects, but um, much greater emphasis on the psychological and social impacts, effects on relationships, for example. And uh, just pointing out for you here some of um, the more recent campaigns. Um, this was the more recent national campaign. This is the highs and lows campaign from Victoria, which um, focused very much on mental health. Origin um, Youth Health was involved in this one, um, and those the videos and stuff are, are really good, and they're still available on the highs and lows website. And this is the very recent New South Wales campaign, which was called Permanently Out of It. So once again, focusing on mental health, and um, the permanently out of it materials are still available on the website uh, as well. So they aren't all lost to time, and we're hoping that the highs and lows campaign we can put onto the Nick Peak website, so it won't be lost um, when. I mean, the funding's already stopped, but eventually the government will, will take down the website, I imagine, so we'll try and keep that live. I personally, this is my favourite campaign, and I've included a couple of other slides from that in future um, of my slides, and uh, that's the, you know, cannabis, use it and you're a dickhead campaign. It was pretty controversial at the time, but it evaluated extremely well, and I just loved the black and white. Um, I think it was a particularly good campaign. Just in terms of, uh, indulge me for a minute on what Nick Pick's doing, um, we have very little mechanism where we have a, a small funding base to reach out to the community, but uh, these are the ways that we do that, and so if any of you are working with young people, please, um, if you're not already participating, think about doing so. We have a, a poster competition every year, 
uh, for 12 to 18 year olds. This is run through schools and the winning entrant gets $2,000 and the school gets $1,500. So it's definitely worthwhile thinking about. And it closes on the 29th of July. And this was our previous last year's winner, which um, focused on the educational impacts of cannabis. The current theme for our competitions is around cannabis and sport. We have um, a short film competition annually and our winners can be downloaded from YouTube through our website. And um, there, there's some really very clever and talented pieces of work there. It's for 15 to 25 year olds. So um, those involved in um, uh, community uh, police youth liaison type um, projects, this will be an excellent thing to think about getting involved in. There's a $5,000 prize money and it closes at the end of October. We also now have an Indigenous music competition, also with $5,000 prize money, and we've got skinny fish on board. So not only do they um, win the money, but they get to have a two-day workshop with skinny fish to get their music professionally produced and contacts made for its distribution. We also do occasional avant-garde materials. This one here was for our withdrawal study, and this was just an initial awareness raising one. Um, and, and they have a terrific reach uh, to get messages out. So looking now more generally, school-based prevention. Um, many of you will be familiar with the models, so I won't go over them, but just to highlight that there's three the social influence models about motivating against use and helping people identify and, and resist pro-drug influences, your straight information type um, message, and also your effective message, um, trying to sort of move people and change their thinking, which emphasise the personality and the values. Um, they, in some ways, assume deficits in self-esteem, communication, decision-making or assertiveness. I'd have to say that amongst um, drug and alcohol uh, researchers and senior clinicians, school-based drug education has a bit of a bad rap. People tend to sort of dismiss it with a wave of the hand and say, well, that's a waste of money. Um, however, um, I've been persuaded um, to the opposite case. Um, a very good recent meta-analysis, which is kind of an, an analysis of studies, um, reported on 15 high quality studies of school drug education, specifically cannabis for the first time, and found that they do have a positive effect on reducing cannabis compared with controls. And those that had the most effect were the more comprehensive, that included all model elements. Um, there was a bit of a move to only look at social influence there for a while, but the best ones had all of the models. More than 14 sessions, um, so it's about the intensity of the program. Sometimes people just looked at the length, how long the program ran for, but it's actually how many sessions um, seems to be the more key factor. Where it's um, facilitated by non-teachers, um, they think here that this perhaps might be that there's, you know, people from outside where it's their field might be a bit more passionate, a bit more motivated, even a bit more credible perhaps um, than teachers. And sometimes it's, it's difficult to just um, find teachers enough space to be trained up um, to that level of intervention. It should, however, while being facilitated by non-teachers, be embedded across the curriculum. An interactive style, which um, we've heard about yesterday, and also to reinforce that um, you need to get them young in, in high school, or not middle school, as they describe it in the US, uh, so younger than 14 years of age to begin um, this kind of cannabis intervention. Something that Nick Pick's doing in this space is uh, working with Origin on making the link. And it's a curriculum-based program for schools to help promote help seeking for cannabis and mental health problems. So um, getting in early for those people that are experiencing distress and smoke, maybe smoking along with that. By seeking help early, of course, um, you reduce problems. And young people are reluctant to seek professional help sometimes, and they tend to turn to people who probably don't know much more than they do. Um, so we have um, a, a couple of uh, materials there. The Making the Link is a whole suite on our website of materials for teachers um, and for young people. And a more general community resource which is kind of a, a mental health first aid approach, how to help someone who you think might be experiencing problems with cannabis and mental health.